Now, Dr. Kopatia, I uh, wanted to mention a little bit about your work. You do work in robotic surgery. Um, yeah, robotic surgery is something that we uh, try to uh, take advantage of in a way to uh, help our patients kind of uh, go through their course a little bit easier than some of the old traditional methods. Now, um, Dr. M, who's uh, Dwight M, who's your uh, a colleague, um, I interviewed him um, about a year ago uh, about his work in, in robotics, and he said he, he really didn't like that term, robotic surgery, because he said uh, people think R2-D2 is during their surgery while he is, this is his quote, outside the OR somewhere drinking coffee. <laughs> so do you run into that sometimes with patients when you say you give them the robotic uh, option? I, th I think that is uh, a, a little bit of a, a misunderstanding sometimes. They do ask that question like, so where will you be while I have the surgery? <laughs> and I have to explain to them that, you know, we're sitting in the room right next to the patient while, while controlling the robotic instrument. And so um, after giving the patient some information, it sounds funny, but they go on YouTube and um, there's, there's a lot of information on there and they pull up videos, and I, I, I encourage patients to, to, to do that, and I think they, they, give, they give me good feedback that they look around and they see some things, and things are less confusing after that. Hmm. Um, uh, and again, talking to, uh, to Dr. M, uh, he likes to say that, well, when you think about it, he is the robot. Um, <laughs> the robot itself, you could just say that it's really no different than a doctor using a scalpel. It's a tool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the doctor is not the scalpel. You know, the doctor is using the scalpel. The doctor is using the robot. So, uh, and you're seeing, I imagine, some pretty fantastic results as a yeah, using I, robot. Yeah, I think um, it really has uh, been able to transform how a lot of these surgeries are done. Um, in, the, in the past, a lot of times when we were doing specifically more, more complicated staging procedures um, for cancers, uh, a lot of times people would be, have a big, big incision on their belly, um, be in the hospital a minimum of three days, sometimes as much as a week if there was any sort of delays. And um, this was not that long ago in, in, in a lot of places. And so um, it, it's changed to where we do these surgeries and uh, the surgeries are done uh, faster with uh, less blood loss and uh, quicker recovery, less pain, and, and the same outcomes in regard to cancer, which is the most important thing. Um, and so it's really, really uh, kind of revolutionized uh, the field. Well, when you're not doing robotic surgery and you're not doing HIPEC, and you're outside of the OR and you're outside the hospital grounds, what do you like to do? Well, I'm, I'm running behind my two children. Um, I have learned to uh, love baseball. I have two kids. Uh, my son is 15 years old, my daughter is 14, and my son loves baseball, so I spend all my weekends in a baseball field. <laughs> Actually, this weekend I have a tournament. And my husband, who is the one who's supposed to take him, sometimes he's out of town, so I, I'm the primary person. Um, so I spend, like most of the time, I run in behind them. My daughter loves to sing. So she sings in a choir, she takes piano lessons, she ice skates. So I have three days of the week with her, the rest of the week with him. On my spare time, I like to cook uh, and I like to, I think I inherited from my grandfather the love for the land. So I love to, I love plants and I love to grow things from seeds. So if I find a seed, I just plant it and I just see what it grows. Hmm. Uh, so I love orchids um, because in Puerto Rico, orchids grow everywhere. Uh, so I have my orchids here and I try to grow my different herbs that I don't get from there. I grew them here. So yeah, I'm growing an avocado tree and right now and I have, I'm growing several li lime and lemon trees. I don't think they're going to grow anything, but I just <laughs> like to see them grow and then see what, how far I can get. Hmm. Yeah. Doctor, how about you? Um, I think <laughs> sort of the same thing. I think, uh, as you, uh, you know, get older and you have a family, uh, you end up just, uh, when you're not working, you want to spend time with them. And so, you know, whatever they're doing is what I'm doing. You know, they're, uh, my son does boxing, uh, which tried, tried to get him into all sorts of things. And that was the one that caught. Um, so he does boxing and we go and do that a couple times a week. My daughter does field hockey. And so we're, you know, busy doing that. And then, um, when we're not doing that, we try to do some family activities together, whether it's watching a movie or, going, you know, apple picking or something like that. Um, you're practicing here at Mercy, so you must like Mercy. <laughs> Why Mercy? 
Um, that's a good question. When I told you that I want to be here for three years, and I am now in 20. Um, I spent 10 years before coming to Mercy in, in a big academic center. Um, I find out that like they're, they're excellent places to work, but at the same time you get lost like in the midst of so many people and a lot of red tape. And I felt like I was not able to accomplish things that I wanted. Like I will never be able to do the high back work that I do in a big academic center, how I can do it here. And I will not be able to have a great collaboration that I have with the surgical oncology department, like if I will be in an academic, big academic center, because there's a lot of egos involved. Um, so when I was looking at changing from an academic practice to a non-academic practice, Mercy caught my attention because it's very solid in, in Maryland. You know, I, it's a smaller institution, but whatever they do, they do it really, really well. And one thing that caught my attention is that the physicians who are here, they stay. The other institution that I was, there was a huge turnover. You know, people come, spend two or three years and they leave. Not at Mercy. Mercy is always like very constant. And I was looking around all the other hospitals. I never was able to get nothing negative from Mercy. Um, so when I was invited to join here, um, then I didn't think it twice. Um, one thing that really bring me back my memory time, I went to a, a, a Catholic school back at home and we used to pray every day at seven in the morning. So like when I came here at Mercy and they prayed at 7.30 in the morning, I was like, oh, wow, like this is kind of like going back to high school and bring me all these good memories. So I felt like I was like right at home and coming here. Doctor, any, any thoughts? Um, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I finished my training and I, I came to Mercy and uh, a big thing for me was location for sure. I mean, my wife, uh, her family is uh, here in Baltimore and my family's in New York and we're close close enough uh, from there. But um, once I started working here, I mean, I think the biggest thing, and, and I say this to our patients all the time, and maybe it sounds like a like a like something you just say, but I worked at plenty of hospitals and I think the quality of care that we give to our patients here is the best. I mean, when, when we have problems, it's a very collegial atmosphere. And if I need help in the operating room and I say, hey, I need a urologist to help me, th there'll be a urologist who just, you know, makes himself available. There's a, a, a general surgeon who would do the same thing if they need to. And I feel like we would do that for our colleagues. And um, you had mentioned ego. And I think most of the doctors here, they're, they're just here for the patients. And uh, I feel like it's a, a really good place to work and a really good place to take care of, uh, to take care of our patients. Mm. Well, our former president and CEO, Tom Mullen, I think would have appreciated what you both said because uh, one of his favorite sayings was that the thing about Mercy is we are a urban community hospital or smaller hospital, but we try and I think succeed in providing academic level of care. And that type of combination is, you know, obviously works well with the physicians and staff and well with the patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Diaz-Montez, Dr. Caputia, I want to thank you both for joining us on the Medoscopy set today. Hopefully our viewers enjoyed this opportunity to learn a bit more about you and maybe a thing or two they could apply to their daily lives. And thank you for watching. On behalf of myself, our guests, the Mercy staff and the Sisters of Mercy, we wish you good health and humor. And until we gather again, May the road rise up to meet you. So you made it all the way through the credits. You're here for, wait, doctor, I forgot to ask. This is where we briefly discuss the question each physician wishes their patients would ask, but don't, or the most unusual hand on the doorknob question posed by a patient at the end of their visit. Dr. Diaz-Montes, we'll start with you. Oh my God. Um, I think I will like for people to ask me when, when we're talking, because most of the patients who come is for surgical discussion, is to 
ask me like what what I'm gonna feel about this. Even I try to give them information or what are what should I expect from this, like more specific, how I'm gonna feel different, stuff like that. Because they we just focus more on the surgical aspect point and the complications, but never at the human aspect of how I'm gonna feel about that. Uh, I, in terms of questions that I've been asked, so many. I think that one of the one that left me perplexed, uh, and it's not a question, was to tell me how much people don't understand about how we talk to them. So I had a patient who I did a hysterectomy three years prior, and then she came to the appointment and she said, I say something, I like, oh, we're following you because you have history of cervical cancer and we did a hysterectomy. So, so. And she's like, oh, that's the reason that I cannot get pregnant. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like, but um, you, you know that if I remove your uterus, you are not going to get pregnant. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. But it, like, it downs me, like how we talk about informed consent and how important it is to inform patients. And we went through informed consent and this woman still didn't get it that if I remove her uterus, then she was not going to be able to get pregnant. So it's just, I just, you just learn every day about how you can communicate and how you can communicate it better. Doctor, um, I, I hear something every once in a while, and it's not just once, but I'm, it always surprises me when a patient gets sent to us. And again, as Dr. Diaz Monte said, we're, we, we, we do surgery. That's kind of what we do. And so patients get sent to us for surgical consultation, go through their pathology, what reason they were sent to us for surgery, go through the planned procedure, how we're going to do it, what we're doing in the surgery, the recovery, talk about the consents the risks, the benefits. And then as we're leaving the, the room, they go, so who's going to do the surgery? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. me. <laughs> it's what I do. <laughs> so always, it, it's, it's happened more than once, but it always kind of gets me. <laughs> I, I've, having been a patient myself and, a, and had several surgeries here, uh, I've experienced hearing sort of like other patients talking to their doctors as I'm sitting there. And um, uh, you know, where the nurse will come in and do the, the prep and I'll, and I'll hear them, well, what are you here for today? What, what's your surgery? And a lot of times they don't know. They don't know. They yeah. don't know what, what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And that always surprised me so much. It's like, you know, what was, what was not happening mm -hmm. where the communication wasn't getting through to this, this person um, that, that they don't even know why they're there for a surgery or what their surgery is about. Yeah. So that must be frustrating. But the same thing, like, I don't know you, I have the practice of when before surgery, I come to the room and I ask them what I am doing today. Yeah. Every and they time. look at me, what well, you're not know what you're doing. <laughs> like, I, I, I just, I'm going to make a clarification. I know what I am doing. I just want to make sure that you know what I am doing. And they come down, but they're like, when I throw it up, it's like, Oh, so you slept well yesterday? Do you know what you're doing? <laughs> like, no, I just want to hear it from you. Mm. Yeah. Live and learn. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.